Hi, everybody. This is Jose Palomino with another episode of Business Growth on Purpose. I'm the CEO of Value Prop Interactive, and I'll be hosting today an interview with Dr. James Richardson. And James is an expert in consumer packaged goods. It's a little off the beaten path of what we normally do here, but the lessons on marketing, on strategy, on how that works has great application. If even if you're in B2B, if you're selling a, a professional or business service, you will enjoy this talk as you learn about a different world than we normally talk about here on Business Growth on Purpose. So very excited to have James join us right now. Well, welcome, James, to Business Growth on Purpose. Thanks for having me, Jose. Yeah, so so why don't you, uh, just for our audience to have a, a context, just tell us a little bit about what you do and who you do it for. I am a strategic planning consultant for fast-growing early stage food, beverage, and personal care brands. Okay, wow. So anything that would be on the shelf at the, at my local Acme, maybe? Or... Pretty much, or Target or Kroger, yeah. Okay, wow. Well, that's its own journey, too, to get something. So you're, you're talking to people who make a product and want to get it out and make it grow because the success of a big consumer brand could be pretty big, right? I mean... Right. Um, you know, the irony of me being on your show, Jose, is that uh, a lot of my content aimed at the younger folks. And I work with a lot of folks new to the industry. So they're, they're kind of innovators first, and then they have to figure out the business. Okay. And there's thousands of these people. Wow. <laughs> um, and- so it's a very different entrance journey than a lot of B2B folks who probably were setting up shop doing something awfully similar to what they used to do. <laughs> these people are really like deer in headlights. And the smart ones survive um, and get to the point where they where they get to hear me tell them enough with the B2B growth strategy. <laughs> Your business grows on the, on the backs of raving fan consumers. And if you can't figure out how to activate them, this is not getting to a hundred million dollars. Wow. So let me just, if I could draw this <laughs> so, no, it's, it's, it's an excellent, excellent point because you know, somebody, I mean, the classic, somebody opens a manufacturing, opens a machine shop because they know mach- they worked yeah. in a machine shop for 20 years. And they even have some friends in the business and they say, hey, do you, if you have any extra lathe work or whatever, send it my way. And before you know it, they're a $5 million contract machine shop, maybe, right? I mean, that's their dream. And that's very B2B. It's very sales oriented yeah. or at least relationship oriented. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In the consumer product world, you can pursue that strategy to a point and say, well, I can get us into the shelves at Costco, or the show, whatever they think is success. But in fact, that's only step one, because you still have to connect with the consumer. Yeah, and I think the, the challenge is that there have been some brands in my industry that just did the B2B and they sort of ratchet up the accounts. They did it at a slow enough pace that unbeknownst to them, word of mouth was doing the marketing for them. They had a great product and it all worked out fine. But, you know, I wrote a book and back of me ramping your brand. So I've done data science on you know how these things grow. And, and when you look at the guys that got to scale from zero uh, and scale in our industry is at least nine figures. I mean, that's when you really okay. start to, that's when you really start to get treated differently by everybody. Okay. All the major retailers are like, okay, now you're one of our top, you're one of our big brands, right? So now we have to really <laughs> treat you seriously. So to get there, you've got to activate the consumer. And that generally requires some kind of thought. It kind of requires a strategy. And there's, it takes time, right? So even a, even a brand that grows in a pure B2B retail account addition, accretion mode in CBG, um, they, uh, it takes enough <laughs> sales cycles, right? That that could be seven to eight, nine years anyways, right? What I found in my book when, we, when my old team did some data science is that it, the folks that were getting to scale weren't just adding accounts. Okay. Because we have access in our industry, we have access to a lot of data. Sure. Very nuanced data sets from cash registers. So we know we can actually measure the influence of distribution growth versus organic growth that we know is coming from consumers who are just more and more excited about the product. So the, the ones that grew like Kindbar really fast, uh, they grew off the backs of consumers uh, who were telling people to go buy it. Or in the case of Kind, they went out and invested in techniques to activate them and spread the word and accelerate that word of mouth. 
they call it accelerating trial. And that's really, really the big annoying challenge for a lot of my clients is how do I do that for my thing? And well, that's how you can add on top of a B2B business, this really cool growth engine that turns the thing into a major a mover in, in, the, in the grocery industry. But if you don't do that, the odds are very clear when, when you look at randomized sets to data, randomized sets of brands that you're gonna hit a wall. If all you're doing is just having sales meetings, you're going to get to a point where um, you've so underinvested in building awareness for your thing that, that the velocities, the, the, how fast it's turning off the shelf at Target and Kroger, they start to hit a wall and they start to go downhill. But, but here's a question, uh, as, I, as I hear that, and I say, okay, I get it. And it makes total sense because, uh, you know, early, earlier days in, in, in our practice at Value Prop, we had a client that was uh, retail. Uh, and, uh, their, and they later said their best day was their worst day. Their best day is they got a big deal at Target, so they had yeah. a lot of product going out. They also learned the hard edge of that, which is, you know, if, <laughs> if it doesn't sell, you have to take it back. And, you know, down to if the boxes are, you know, right le leaning versus left leaning or whatever, you get penalized. And, and all of those incredible experiences of just the mechanics of distribution of how it works. And I can't imagine today has gotten any easier. So like it's probably no, it's gotten more, worse, it's <laughs> much more rigorous. And, you know, people, Walmart, all those and, you know, fine firms, whatever. But they do things the way they do things to yeah. maximize their profit. But but here's the question, though. Uh, so you have. Um, uh, in consumer product good, I mean, it sometimes seems like everything that could be developed, I know it's not like the patent office in 1880 or something, has been developed, but it seems like, does the world need another shampoo? You know, does it need another brand of soap? Does it need, need another razor blade? And yet, we see these things do come out and some of them become huge success. An another power bar type thing, and you mentioned kind, right? Just that, in, in some form, it existed before, but something about that brand or that packaging or that positioning caught people's imagination enough so that it actually built the brand, even though you could objectively say, well, chemically, this, this has already existed for the last 20 years, you know? Well, what you know, I, yeah, what I say about kind bar, what I say about kind bar is it's just a, it's just a pile of trail mix in a rectangle. <laughs> so it absolutely was already for sale tw uh, four aisles over in the trail mix section, right next to the private label nuts. So absolutely, it was for sale. Um, did it have the exact same nutritional profile? No, probably had too much sugar. But trail mix has always had the same healthy profile to consumers mm -hmm. that a kind bar has. They're basically right. equivalent, uh, symbolically, right? So yeah, right. this is where you have to start thinking like an anthropologist, which is you have to understand that um, in the world of branded goods consumption, remember, you know, this stuff fills our houses and apartments. Mm -hmm. um, we may not consciously think about the decisions behind them, but that's actually why culture is driving most of the decisions. Okay. And that culture is influenced by um, mega trends and mega forces, but it's actually also really influenced by your local social network that you're part of, your proximate social world. So if you're in a world where people are filling their pantries with natural organic stuff and talking up fresh and talking about healthy eating and aren't obese, mm -hmm. And it's 2005, something like Kind Bar shows up and it looks very cutting edge in that context of that social world, but also in the context of every other bar out there, which is a processed slab bar filled with all sorts of crap. Mm -hmm. Even Cliff Bar was highly processed. It just didn't have synthetics. So in that frame of energy bars, Kind Bar looked really innovative, even, at, even though actually all it did was create a new technical process to move trail mix into that cat. Well, it's interesting when you put it. <laughs> now yeah. that's, this is not Dan Lebetsky's thought process. Right. But I'm just saying that this, even the idea for kind bar is not Dan Lebetsky's. It's, a, right. it, 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 this is not how things happen, right? So creation is about the sort of coincidence of various forces, right? That's basically what innovation is. And you can harness that or not harness it. So he had the concept for the pot, the product, but it was very much driven by other trends that he was probably a part of. I think what's interesting you have to accept is that the brand owner has one power 
And that is that if they're early enough in the trend curve in the consumption category, and in my world, you really have to think narrowly about that because that's how consumers think. Um, you think narrowly about it, then you can be the one who actually defines the new cool thing. And, and this doesn't surprise me as a cultural anthropologist because we're all trained in academia that most of the human belief systems are completely arbitrary. Uh, they could be swapped out like table napkins. Now, they can't literally be because people get upset. <laughs> right. Right. But if you've studied, you know, hundreds and hundreds of cultures like I have, you know, I've looked at more cultural diversity than most people on the planet. Um, real cultural diversity too, <laughs> not which brand of shampoo do I buy, right. <laughs> but you realize how arbitrary these systems are on top of some basic fundamental uh, human needs and values. This is part of this big brain up here is we just create stuff, right? So the power of the marketer in my industry is not actually, it's not so much to be the first one to solve a problem. It's to be the person to redefine how to solve the problem and convince enough people that this is the cool new way to do it, who then tell other people and who tell other people and it grows from there. So it's very much like the fashion industry, but at a slower speed. That's what's going on in my world. <laughs> so how much and, of that world, and this and, is- and, and just to finish the yeah. thought, in natural organic foods, people often use a very rational health narrative to justify the new cool modern thing. And that is really an unassailable narrative within certain social classes in the United States, mostly college educated people. People, if you lead with that and then introduce something after that statement, most people are, are listening who are, who are college grads. Because you create, you're, you're it's, hitting it's, a, a it's cultural literally, hook for that. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Know. It's amazing how powerful it is to just open with saying, hey, I found this really new and healthy thing like, uh, to optimize my diet. You're going to get most people to listen. So it's like most marketing, the, the <laughs> rational, the rational is not, we all as buyers want to think we behave rationally and always responding to just rational inputs. But in fact, there's some, there's some level, there's something more primal, often whether it's a car or a computer system or whatever, at some level. Well, I would argue that healthy, the healthy eating trend, and I've written about this in my book, a healthy eating trend in the United States, which started in the upper middle class, studied about amongst people like us, so say. <laughs> most grad educated people you know it's only like five percent of the country it started there for a reason because it was about refashioning their the, the identity of those folks Interesting. in contradistinction to the mass hordes at walmart so these are these the reason these statements ca captivate attention and people are open to all these new trends and food is because there there's a lot of insecurity that people have over where they fit in u.s society and, and there should be, um, because we've gone through a lot of social change in the last 60, 70 years. So and would you say these same dynamics, although maybe played out differently, apply in any culture, like it would be the they same? Do, they do. If you inject the kind of social change that we've seen in the US into another society, and it's, it's not like it hasn't happened, it's been happening in China. Right. It's been happening in India where I've done research. So it does happen. Uh, but in some parts of the world, it's not happening at the same rate uh, at all. So, because some areas are more resistant to external forces, but we're a country that um, primes everybody to be open to the new cool thing because we have a consumer driven society. We have a consumer driven uh, way of interacting and defining who we are mm -hmm. that we don't always accept. Um, so, even though this choice or that choice doesn't mean that much to us, when you put it all together and look at the 300 categories of consumer good in our homes, <laughs> it's a big deal. Well, you know, it's even, it's even it's even very literal. I mean, going back, I mean, I'm old enough to remember when you know, uh, fashion design clothes started putting the logo on the outside. Yeah, exactly. You know, so it's like you literally yeah. were stamping yourself, saying, "I belong to whatever the brand was." Right. So, fashion's the the most insane <laughs> version of this. We know this is all bullshit. We know it's arbitrary, and the guy who's making the money now is the guy who's got the latest thing. And they've convinced the right influencers and trendsetters that this is the thing. And then they move it through the socials. They move it through distribution and the stakeholder sets in society such that the other people who generally are following along try it. Now, 
it's a little easier in the fashion industry because those systems are so concentrated and elitist. It's a lot different in my world because there's 500 grocery chains mm. <laughs> and they have all different kinds of shoppers <laughs> and not all of them are the right place to start. If you're trying to reinvent um, high priced nutrition bars, you don't start at Acme. Right. Unless you, you might don't go, know what you you're doing. Whole foods or yeah, you don't know drugs. what you're doing and you get misled by a broker who's just monetizing his percent of the case volume and then forgets your phone number. Right. Interesting. <laughs> that's, that's the B2B game in the yeah. game, right? It's I mean, brutal. <laughs> it, it's brutal because as I write about, you know, the, on my blog too, like in, B2, in CBG, that B2B component, for lack of a better world, we're, is full of very unethical people. <laughs> okay. it, it's not like other industries. You think it's particularly sharp? Oh, it's really bad. <laughs> okay. And the only thing worse than it is co-manufacturing in the U.S. Because those are those are those are all nepotistic family businesses, almost everyone. Wow. Because the capital it took to build them was immense. So these were wealthy immigrant families, often the East Coast Midwest, who put this capital into these things. And and once you build a plant that makes cheese. Unless you're a complete idiot, you will have business forever, unless the category dies. Right. People <laughs> stop eating cheese. Be, right. Well, because right. I can't, you and I can't wake up without prior experience and go get a 30 to $50 million capital construction loan to build a plant. Right. <laughs> so, it's no. like, so you have to work with these people and right. they know it. Right. And then so, there's a lot of trouble, some stakeholders for small business people to work with because they, they kind of need you, but not really. You know, so the B2B game is very exhausting. A lot of companies fold because they mismanage stakeholders and they mm -hmm. basically go cash flow negative and it's over. Yeah, that's a short, that's a, that's the runway. That's, that's, well, that's why I started two to three. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> no, you, because, you do, you start. Because I, I know I've got people who they probably have above average business sense. So, so question. Probably. <laughs> Well, you talked about like influencers, influencers and so on. And, and so I, I wonder, I mean, clearly, I mean, you have like, you know, an 18 year old girl became is a TikTok influencer with 3 million followers and apparently, getting paid, yeah. apparently and getting paid real bank for saying she eats this or uses this makeup or whatever. Right. And has no other discernible talent other than that has followers. Right. But it, it just strikes me as that's kind of ephemeral. I mean, I can't see that being a, it's not a long that's, lasting. Yeah. Thing. That's not the kind of influence that I talk about. Okay. So the kind of influence that drives trial, um, it, it's actually your friends. Okay. And in my book, I talk about two kinds of social world. It's the people you work with, assuming you actually like your people at your work. Some people okay. hate everyone at their. Uh, some people hate everyone at work. So <laughs> but sure. if you actually have friends at work, right? Boom. Um, the other one are the recreational lifestyle networks that you participate when mm -hmm. you're not at work. And obviously that skews a little, it skews outside the child rearing window of about 15 years. But since we live forever, most of America is in those networks. Okay. We only have, we're only raising kids for like a fifth of our lives. So, um, so for those of us with kids listening, just remember you're the weirdo. <laughs> Demographically, like most homes are not like yours. Right. <laughs> so, so most people have time to go do stuff. We got oodles of time. <laughs> um, and it's in those worlds where you have these intimate relationships that things spread really fast. They're high trust worlds. And in high trust social networks, probably not your family, Jose. Okay. I'm not saying you specifically, the average person listening is probably not actually your family. Because Americans, especially Caucasians, have a very screwed up relationship with their extended family. That's actually not the highest trust place to spread things. It's actually in the workplace and it's actually in these lifestyle worlds. The lifestyle worlds are often full of fantasy. So you become very receptive to all sorts of crazy stuff, right? Um, weekend warrior was a thing that I participated in before I had kids. I was the weekend warrior mountain biker, right? So I wanted to fantasize that I was still a 21 year old bike racer. <laughs> so you could sell me anything that was related to mountain biking. Okay. And, you, and they did. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, you're in that receptivity, but that's when, that's when people can be influenced. It's not actually by famous people. Not in the world I'm in. And okay. that's because, um, you know, the, the, the fact that Brad Pitt 
eats this brand of something, you know, it probably would cause a bump of sales if he just showed it on his Instagram. Mm -hmm. He doesn't actually do that stuff, by the way, as far as I know. Right. He doesn't get, he's not a whore to, to, the, to that industry because um, it doesn't interest him and he's rich anyways. But I think if he did, there would be a bump, like you said, but it wouldn't actually sustain anything. It becomes sure. almost a curiosity. Right. Because the reasons you buy things or actually buy food, beverage, and personal care are so personal that it takes super high trust people to influence those decisions. And Brad Pitt is a dumb celebrity. You actually don't trust him, even if you admire him. Does that make sense? Well, that and-, and like I, If he came to your house, you wouldn't let him tell you what to put in your pantry. You would right, laugh. And I, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't <laughs> find them relatable as somebody- no. Well, even if you did, even right. if you were a Gen X woman who grew up right. fawning over him, you still wouldn't listen to him, tell you what to buy for shampoo. It's like, who the hell are you? Right. Like, you don't know my hair. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyways, this is the fallacy of influencer marketing in my industry. What tends to create influence is, is seeding word of mouth through, through events. So having your brand appear inside lifestyle events or the workplace. You mm -hmm. know, Before COVID, one of the biggest word of mouth engines was actually um, getting your brand into the office kitchen. Um, if you could get a thousand office admins to be ordering a case of you, you would grow your retail sales in local markets. Which makes perfect sense now. Because they're getting the free sample from the boss. Right, right. And if, they, if it was well thought out and not like my old office, crazy. It was, right. it was what the Walmart shopping admin wanted to eat, not us. <laughs> yeah, a class problem was. <laughs> That's funny. But um, if it was a different kind of office, it could be really, it used to be a great thing. So those are the worlds where the things act. That's where influence is real. And it can happen really fast. I mean, if your best friend tells you go try something and you trust their opinion about this or that, um, people try really fast. Yeah, and in, I see in, that. In a food or beverage, because no, it doesn't matter. If you try your friend's suggestion and it sucks, it's not the end of the world. It was, th it was three right. hours. And, and a very obvious manifestation of that is like a new eatery opens up and your friend went to it and it's yeah. your neighbor, you know, somebody you're close to and say, hey, oh, you should check them out. They're really great. The pizza's fantastic but or whatever. Follow on, it's right. a lot harder to get. It's, you won't take a car recommendation very easily, even from your friends. Because that, again, gets even more personal. And it's right. more high ticket. And it becomes more self-focused. More, and, more at uh, stake. And getting right. it so wrong. So you might listen to someone say, you're more likely to listen to someone to say, don't buy Mazda, they always break down, than, right. hey, I drive a Honda Fit and you should buy one too. That's a much, that doesn't really work. And that's why car companies spend $100 million a year in advertising. Gotcha. Because <laughs> they, they don't have a word of I mean, they can right. do that's event marketing and other stuff, but unless you're a really sexy brand like Mini Cooper, and right. Mini Cooper, by the way, is a multi-billion dollar brand. It doesn't do any advertising, as far as I can tell. Literally, people wait 20 years to buy these things. Talk about a consideration phase. <laughs> wow. I have well, one, too. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. So, well, Dr. James Richardson, thank you for joining us today on Business Growth on Purpose. I mean, this is a topic that we could keep going on, but yeah. if somebody <laughs> listening wanted to know about your book, about you, your work, where should they go? Well, the book Ramping Your Brand is on Amazon.com. Very easy to find. Uh, if they want to learn about what I do, I'm at PremiumGrowthSolutions.com. And there's a lovely little website. Lots of free info, webinars, courses, you name it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for stopping by. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to another episode of Business Growth on Purpose. If you like the show, hit subscribe and leave us a review to help other people find the podcast. And if you're ready to take the next step in driving intentional growth for your business, come check out what we're doing at valueprop.com. We've developed industry-leading programs and systems to help B2B owners take control of their growth. Until then, thanks for listening to another episode of Business Growth on Purpose.